wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. We got a most exciting guest on. He is the brilliant author of a multitude of books, like a whole multitude. We just put in the uh, Google machine authors with multitudes of brilliant books and his name was top of the list that came up his name is blake bailey he will be on the show today and he'll be uh, telling us about his latest book about another brilliant author it's like one of those russian things where there's like the doll inside of the doll and you keep opening them up he's like the great author who did the biography of another great author so there you go i don't know what i'm talking about clearly but anyway <laughs> we'll be talking about him and his new book that just came out you want to check it out and order it up it's available now for april 6 2021 so you want to get your pre-order in so you can be the first one on your block your little book club to read about it to see the books we're reading go to goodreads.com for it chris voss to see the brilliant video interview you're gonna to want to see the interview on youtube.com hit the bell notification so you can get all the wonderful notifications of everything we did and also go to all the groups we have on facebook linkedin instagram as well and all that good stuff. So let me give you the rundown. The book is Philip Roth, the biography. Blake Bailey is the author of the acclaimed biographies of John Cheever, Richard Yates, and Charles Jackson. And his biography of Philip Roth is now being published here in April. He is the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award and Francis Parkman Prize from the Society of American Historians. And he's a finalist for, or he was a finalist for the Pulitzer and James Tate Black Prizes. His most recent books, The Splendid Things We Planned, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Autobiography. And he lives in Virginia with his wife and daughter. Welcome to the show. Blake, how art thou? I'm good. Thank you, Chris. Happy to be here. I think we got uh, some of your extraordinary career. I look, I read your bio on your website, which is even more lengthy and extraordinary. So congratulations, and congratulations on the launch of this new book coming out soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's It's been kind of bouncy. Well, let's get to it then. Okay. Uh, do, do we get your dot-coms for people to look you up on the interwebs? Uh, it is blakebaileyonline.com. There you go. There you go. And Easy to uh, and uh, order that up. Go to your local booksellers. You can pre-order it now and uh, be the first one on your block to get it. That way you get those brag bragging rights. You're like, I read it first. But what motivated you want to write this book? Okay, Philip has an, uh, he is a figure of enormous international cultural importance. How important is he? I I'll tell you. Back in 2006, the New York Times canvassed something like 200 literary critics, professors, etc., and said, name the best American novel of the last 25 years. And on the final list of 22 novels, six were by Philip Roth. Wow. Now, bear in mind that that was just 25 years between 1981 and 2006, but two of Philip's most famous novels had been written long before 1981. Portnoy's Complaint, which made him a millionaire and internationally notorious, it's all about masturbation, it was 1969, and that's on the modern library list of the 100 greatest English uh, language novels of the 20th century. Ten years before Portnoy was Goodbye Columbus, which made Philip the, to this day, youngest ever winner of the National Book Award. Wow. And beyond 2006, on the other side of that, he continued to write novels, profound novels about, about human mortality and faith, because Roth was very old by then. Yeah. Published 31 books, won every prize but the Nobel. Wow. That seems... And was very controversial. So should he have won a Nobel or shouldn't he have won a Nobel? What's your judgment on that? 
uh, the, the, the Swedes um, are surprisingly, perhaps counterintuitively enough, they're a bit on the uh, puritanical side. The Swedes, mm. of all people. The Nobel is given by the Swedish Academy, and and they thought that, again, his most famous novel, arguably, is Portnoy's Complaint. It's about a guy who masturbates with his family's liver. <laughs> okay? I'm sorry. That's what it's that's what it's about, among other things. There you go. And uh, also, his second wife was the actress Claire Bloom, and uh, she wrote a memoir after their relationship broke up called Leaving a Doll's House. And it paints an extremely damning portrait of Philip Roth. Oh, no. That sounds yeah. like something that would happen to me someday. But I am following a, an OnlyFans account that does that liver thing. Anyway, moving on. So give us an overarching story of what you've laid out in the book. And then was this an, uh, was this an approved biography? Did you Were you able to work with his estate? or I worked with Philip. He was still alive while I was working for six years while I was working on the book. Philip was my first living subject. My three previous subjects were all safely dead. Mm. And I just had to deal with the estate, with the children, the widow, which is dicey enough in itself. But Philip was alive and very formidable. He had read my Cheever biography. He and Cheever had been pleasant acquaintances. And uh, what he liked about it, and this is mentioned, I, there is a profile of me in this Sunday's New York Times magazine. You might want to check it out. There you go. Anyway, what he liked about my, my Cheever biography, according to his best friend, Ben Taylor, was that there was a sort of moral neutrality to it. In other words, I report the bad and the good, and there was plenty of bad and good for Cheever and for Philip, and let the chips fall where they may. I collect the evidence and present things in terms of their relative importance. And so he knew that I would give the whole story and that some of it wouldn't be flattering, but he thought that was probably the right way to go. That's brave of him. I would have trouble, especially if I was still alive, uh, authoring someone to my biography and be able to dig through my life. But maybe it is better if you do it while someone's alive because then you can lean on them a little bit, be like... Right, it's, it's unsettling. And uh, some people, the book has been... We haven't even published yet. We publish on the 6th. And already there's been about 25 reviews and <laughs> they take a, a variety of opinions. But some think that I was Philip's patsy and mm -hmm. that he successfully manipulated me and so on. I don't know where they get that idea. In fact, <laughs> they, on the one hand, say that I'm Philip's patsy and on the other hand, say that he comes across as a complete monster in my book. If I was his patsy... <laughs> Why does he come across as a monster? I don't get it. Does that make Maybe sense? Maybe he wanted to come across as a monster. That's how I would have mine read. I well, mine read. I look, one of his most famous novels is Sabbath Theater, won him his second National Book Award. And he said that was the most autobiographical protagonist he ever wrote. And Mickey Sabbath is a very dirty old man. Sounds like me. The No, they, they, it's interesting because from all the research I was doing on him, he wrote, wrote a lot of books, he gave a lot of speeches, he talked about a lot of his opinions on things, pretty unabashed it seemed, and probably made some people that didn't like him maybe so much, and maybe some other people did like him. And then, of course, here you come and you write the autobiography and you're going to take all the arrows. I'm, I'm taking a few arrows, yeah. There's a movement afoot to cancel Philip because oh, of certain oh. revelations in my book, and certainly around in, in the academic milieu as it currently stands, Philip is not terribly popular. He's the last great white male mm. American writer, and he had this reputation for misogyny, which does him no favors. Yeah. Yeah. And again, nor did Claire Bloom's book, Leaving a Doll's House, do Philip any favors. So give us an overarching view of the book and the man. Let's play like there's a lot of people who don't know who this gentleman was. And uh, so that we can open up that audience for you to pick up the book as well. But what would be the best way to describe him or some of his work or, or what you laid out in the book? In, in some he's, of a, he's a man of vast contradictions. As far as his work, I've tried to suggest to you his importance. Again, his career spanned 
in 55 years. His first book out of the gate when he was 26 won the National Book Award, Goodbye Columbus, who was made into a very good movie with Ollie McGraw and uh, Richard Benjamin. If you haven't seen it, you should, but you should read the book first. And so on. He, he Again, he won every literary award internationally going. He was the only living author in the Library of America, which yes. is sort of the canonical yeah. library. He's the only, he was the only living non-French author in the Bibliothèque de Pléiade in France. And this is a, a, a figure of monumental cultural importance. Yeah. Yeah. Dealing with Philip on a face-to-face -face basis was pretty intimidating. Did he give you a layout of what he wanted you to do, or did he pretty much give you carte blanche and say, All right, what, whatever, the, whatever you will? The epigraph to my book is, don't try to rehabilitate me, just make me interesting. <laughs> Philip said those very words to me. Now, did he mean them is the question you should be mm. asking yourself and which I often had cause to ask myself. On the one hand, Philip affected a kind of Olympian detachment to how the public perceived him one way or the other. He never publicly answered the very damning portrait in his ex-wife Claire Bloom's book. Never. However, he gave me a 300-page uh, typescript called Notes for My Biographer, which answered Claire Bloom's book practically paragraph by paragraph. Oh, wow. Philip knew that he wasn't going to live much longer when I came on board, which was 2012. And his legacy was very much on his mind, despite the Olympian indifference <laughs> to public perception that he affected. And uh, so he was very enthusiastic, especially in the early years before he got tired of me constantly digging into his life and bothering his privacy and his health was going south and so on. But he gave me thousands of pages of personal papers and made himself available for many, maybe a hundred hours of interviews. I interviewed all his surviving friends, his family, his lovers, his enemies, and so on. And Philip was quite aware that I was talking to people who were unsympathetic, and it made him very nervous. But it mm -hmm. would make me nervous, too. Yeah, I, it would be, too. It's, it's quite the brave move. I think uh, Steve Jobs went through that with, I forget the brilliant author of Steve Jobs' autobiography. But I think Steve Jobs knew he was a real jerk, so he kind of knew it was going to come. Walter Isaacson, I think. Walter Isaacson, book. yes. Yeah. We've been trying to get him on for the new book he's got coming out, or he has out. But so what was... so? This uh, response that he gives to his ex-wife's book, does this make it in this book? <laughs> yes, of course it does. Okay. I've been called everything from... Whoa. What did... Yeah, what was... It? Hold on for a second. I'm going to just... I'm just <laughs> We're going to read the review. this up <laughs> and look at this. Yeah, I love this. So the Wall Street Journal review, it's the front pager. It's going to run tomorrow by Sam Sachs, calls me heroically fair-minded heroically fair-minded. I like that. Because some people out there say that I am Roth's apologist, even uh -huh. that I am his wingman, that again, I was his patsy, that he played me like a fiddle. Sounds I don't know like they how need they... To pick a, they need to pick a rail or something. <laughs> there you go. I, and I don't know, again, how they possibly reach that conclusion, especially since they also think that Roth is a monster. Again, if I can't be a patsy who portrayed him as a monster because he certainly did not want to be portrayed as a monster. So anyway, I tried to give both sides of the story. I certainly give Claire Bloom and various other women in Philip's life at least equal time. But I, I do think that Philip's side of the story should be known. And in every case, I know what Philip's side of the story was. Do you feel like you're presenting the story as objectively as possible? Putting these arrows and barbs aside from you're always going to have that haters. Do you feel that you really uh, what, what did you put in to try and portray the story in the best way that you wanted to do? What was the work you put in there? Let's get that on the table. A well-known editor at a well-known magazine tweeted yesterday that she doesn't know why people accept implicitly Roth's version of his first wife, Maggie, who is dead. He, he portrayed her in an autobiography titled The Facts and in a thinly fictionalized uh, novel called My Life as a Man. And she is a monster in those books. Mm. I mean, a monster. She tricks him into marriage. He's this young man about to publish his first book and about to become 
famous and he's brilliant and he's handsome and so on and she's this divorced mother of two troubled illiterate children and she's won't go away and finally when she pawns his typewriter he says you have to go and she says i can't <laughs> she says i can't i'm pregnant oh and so Philip, I think reasonably enough, says, prove it, <laughs> and gives her a, an empty herring jar, which she pees into, and is directed to take it to Estroff's pharmacy around the corner. Instead, she went to Tompkins Square Park, this was in the East Village, New York, and uh, found an obviously pregnant woman, and paid her two or three dollars to pee into the jar. Wow. And so she fooled Philip into... <laughs> thinking she was pregnant, and he obligingly, he married her, and it was a complete catastrophe and a nightmare. So this person said, this editor, thinking that Roth is a monster, and why should we believe him about this horrible first wife, and it's mean to portray women as aggressive and hysterical and so forth. Here's why you should believe Philip's version of Maggie. Her children are still alive. They're in their 60s. I mm-hmm. interviewed both of them. They both essentially said that Maggie was a monster. Wow. Especially the son. They both said that Philip Roth saved our lives. He was sweet and decent to us. He arranged for us to be properly educated and so on. I talked to the husband, the first husband, who is now 90 something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he certainly had hard things to say about Maggie. I had her diary. I had her diary. Oh, you had her diary too? Oh. (laughs) Okay. So she says. Maggie says about herself, this is just one a couple of lines from her own diary. Are you ready? Yeah. Maggie wrote, I have the mind to reason what is right and wrong, but I have no moral repugnance to keep me from anything. But I have a huge amount of self-pity where my wickedness keeps me from having the good things that life gives to good girls. Wow. So she's basically admitting that she's a sociopath. Yeah, okay. that's insightful for a sociopath. <laughs> there you go. So that's that's why maybe you should allow in that just particular case that Maggie was an imperfect human being. Yeah, at least she was insightful. I'm like in complete denial on my sociopathy. But uh, <laughs> collecting pee at, at uh, local public parks, we just call that Fridays at my house. There uh, you go. So your book was named the most anticipated books of 2021 by Oprah Magazine, so she might like you a bit. Uh, Chicago (laughs) Tribune, The Guardian Literary Hub, The Times, Financial Times, etc. Yeah, it's you've written a lot of other books about other people. Is this one getting you the most spears, arrows, and uh, oh, there there is no American writer that that certainly I can think of who is more controversial. And more hated, let's face it, loved by many because he was a great writer than Philip Roth. So, yeah, this is it's been a pretty bouncy ride. And again, we haven't even published the book yet. Yeah, it's not even out. You just wait till that. It's a right. Um, There's some different values in those areas. And and definitely with the advent of women's rights and more civil rights and different things have changed. That is very much in line with how Philip explains his own behavior. Uh, When he married his first wife, Maggie, in 1959, he said, I was a typical mid-century American male who was taught to value himself based on how many crippling obligations he was willing to assume. The job, children, wife, etc. You did your duty. You did what was expected of you. And plus, he was a nice, he was a nice Jewish boy. That's his term. That's his term. He was born in the the Jewish section of Wequaic in Newark, New Jersey. And he was a coddled child and a gifted child. And until Maggie came into his life, he was an extremely, highly sexed always, but extremely well-behaved young man. But Maggie so completely ravaged his life and then suddenly died violently in the next, died violently in 1968. Had she lived, she they were still in divorce proceedings. She would have taken the millions of dollars he made from Portnoy's complaint. Anyway, after the Maggie disaster, he said... Chekhov has this thing. Chekhov said, I had to squeeze the surf out of me drop by drop. Chekhov came from surf, from the lower orders. And uh, Philip said, I had to squeeze the nice Jewish boy out of me drop by drop. Hmm. Let the repellent in. Don't try to be more virtuous than it is in your nature to be. 
That's and brilliant. so the Philip of the second half of his life was fundamentally different from the young man. And this is what authors go through. They write from their experience. They write through the life experience. It's part of the whole art of it, the journey and how it shapes you through life. And there was certainly a journey in, in Philip's case. If you look at the difference between Portnoy's Complaint and Sabbath Theater, Portnoy was published in 69, and Sabbath Theater was published almost 30 years later. Okay, mm -hmm. And Portnoy's Complaint is a clinical disorder coined by Philip Roth. And uh, it is defined as follows, a disorder in which strongly felt altruistic impulses are perpetually warring with extreme sexual longings, often of a perverse nature. Mm. Okay, so here is a divided soul. Here is a person who behaves badly as a sexual being and then feels very guilty about it because mm -hmm. he had this Jewish mother who expected him to be a nice Jewish boy and punished him when he was not. Mickey Sabbath, so that's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mickey Sabbath, 30 years later, is all Mr. Hyde. Okay, he, <laughs> there is no guilt mm -hmm. at all. He's fuck it all. No, just, the, I, I was watching some video interviews of his late in life, and, and he seemed very, I'm trying to think of the right word, but he seemed very aware that he was aging. I'm 53. I'm starting to become very aware. I just realized the other day that in two more years, I can move into a senior citizen community. And I'm like, what? When did this happen? But I was watching some interviews with him, and, and he seemed very aware that he was getting, and, and I think his writing picked up at that time, didn't it? Yes and no. Most writers of the first rank do their best work in mm. midlife, in mm. their 40s and in their 50s, when they're still v vigorous enough to have the energy for it, because it, mm. it takes a lot of energy, but, and have lived long enough to you know, cultivate their gift and, mm. uh, and to gain life experience. In Philip's case, arguably, his greatest work was achieved in the 90s when he was in his 60s. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote his American trilogy, uh, the first volume of which, American Pastoral, won the Pulitzer, and so on. And yeah, so Philip had this wonderful late life resurgence where he wrote his greatest books. But by the time I came along in 2012, he had stopped writing for two years Wow, and was in very compromised health. And I think in the interview I saw, he said he averaged about two to three years to write a book on average. I'd say he aver he published 31 books. His career was 55 years, so, so that's about a book every other year or so. There you go. There you go. Um, but when he was really clicking, it was once a year. Boom, boom. Yeah. There you go. I think I saw his, I think he was pretty late in his career in the interview I saw. I think he might have been in his 70s or 80s. How long did he live to be? He lived to be 85, which is nothing short of, of miraculous. He was uh, diagnosed in 1982 when he was 49 with coronary artery disease. Hmm. Seven years later, he had a quintuple bypass. And for the rest of it, he didn't want to take beta blockers because they compromised his potency. Oh, wow. And potency <laughs> was very important to Philip. So he had to contain it with diet and exercise. So Philip, people who have a hard time with Philip's disreputable private behavior as they perceive it, need to bear in mind that much of Philip's waking life was positively monkish. Most of it was spent alone in a room at a desk. And when he wasn't at the desk, he, was, he couldn't eat any red meat or any eggs or salt or chicken with skin on it and so on. And he exercised and he had a, the terrible back. So Philip was tough. He was tough, yeah. and that wasn't uh, the only admirable things about him either. Yeah. So what was the last thing that you, the last conversation maybe you had, and is it in the book with him? <laughs> the last conversation I had with Philip, I recall, it was a difficult conversation because Philip had just had a transaortic valve replacement. He had just had his aortic valve replaced with cow tissue. Mm -hmm. And that will take it out of you. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So he was so exhausted. He could barely leave his Eames chair and go to the bathroom. He was just completely wiped out. And he had nurses and taking care of him and so on. I had that day been in his agent's office and l looking through some files. And I had seen some things that I wanted to talk with him about of a rather compromising nature. Mm -hmm. So I was asking him questions and he was in a surly mood 
which he's entitled to. He felt bad. He was sick. And he was answering, saying, it's not in my interest to answer these questions. You need to change the subject. <laughs> and I kept persisting. And so at one point, he's getting more and more agitated. And, and he goes, this is the best I've felt in weeks, fucker. There you go. So there you go. Oh, there you go. That was very Philip. And how was it Philip? I will tell you. Philip could be very imperious and stern. He was the maestro. He was our greatest living novelist, etc. But if he if he was in that kind of browbeating mood, you could always appeal to his humor. There you, you know? go. And if you were yeah, you could always crack <laughs> that maestro facade. So out of all of his books, which is your personal favorite? I'm glad you asked that, Chris. I had to provide a list of five out of 31 to, mm. to Kirkus, and they are as follows. His first book, Goodbye Columbus, which uh, that would really piss Philip off because he, <laughs> he detested that book. It won him the National Book Award at age 20. Yeah. He, thought it was, he, he thought it was kid stuff, and he was deeply embarrassed by it. So, Goodbye Columbus, it's charming. Everyone should read Goodbye Columbus. Uh, if you're out there and you haven't read it yet, it's short, it's funny, it's sexy, it's cool. So, first book, Goodbye Columbus, then Portnoy's Complaint, which is hilariously funny, and one of the filthiest books ever <laughs> written to this day. It, it, a book of enormous cultural importance. Obscenity laws in Australia were completely abolished as a result of Portnoy's complaint mm -hmm. because everyone wanted to read it and they wouldn't let them. <laughs> you know? uh, okay, so Portnoy's complaint, hilarious, filthy, The Ghost Rider, which was 10 years after Portnoy's complaint, 1979. It's the first volume in the Zuckerman cycle. Zuckerman is Philip's uh, alter ego. It's a ri Jewish writer like Philip. Uh, Ghost Rider's terrific. Probably my favorite. And then American Pastoral, which was the Pulitzer winning first volume of his American trilogy. And just let me say, the incredibly protean nature of Philip's work. You go from Portnoy's Complaint, which is farcical and filthy, to, to American Pastoral, which is essentially tragic. Mm -hmm. Very somber book. Um, about a virtuous man who was blindsided by the 60s, by history. His daughter blows up the general store and kills a man. Wow. Okay. Completely tonally different, those two books. And that was Philip. He had many sides to him. And so that's my fourth. And the fifth would be Everyman, which was published in 2006, and it's all about death. As Philip would say, this book is about death. You'll love it. You'll love so, it. <laughs> those, those are five books. That's, that, that will get you launched on Philip Roth. So it sounds like he was a very complex man, especially those maybe who didn't have him in his books or didn't know him. And uh, But he was funny, witty, brilliant, but complex. He was very complex. And those who say that, that Philip was not nice to women, as Claire Bloom certainly said in her memoir, at his deathbed, I was there, New York Presbyterian. There were seven or eight former lovers. One of them was 86 years old. She'd come with a wow. helper. And much. And if you have seven or eight former girlfriends visit you when you're dying, you you've done something right. Yeah, wouldn't that's you true. agree? I would agree that I would agree. Yeah, that. and he was a, he was a person who, you know to his friends enormously generous and and enormously loyal. If you were sick, if you were in the hospital, Philip would visit you every other day. He wow. would help cover your medical expenses. He would call your friends and help try to get them to help out, etc. This and, and this didn't happen once or twice. This was his mo. This was mm -hmm. how he rolled. And I could go on. He did a lot of admirable things, but he could behave swinishly, and he did that too. And is this in the book, and then is this maybe something that's important that the critics of bo both you and him with the, the book now should really take a deeper look at the good things the man did as well? That is the hope. That is the hope for every subject that I write about. My theory of biography is if you tell the whole story, both the bad and the good, it will come out in the wash. A person's mm -hmm. humanity comes through. And... I think I've succeeded in my book about Philip, and some agree, and some don't. There you go. Likely this is the sort of thing that would turn into a movie. Has it been optioned yet, and who do you see playing uh, Philip? That's a good question. Liev Schreiber? Am mm -hmm. I saying that right? Horrible. You horrible. don't know who Liev I am a face. I'm not a name guy. 
Okay, yeah, well, uh, Leo Schreiber, he's a terrific actor. He looks a little bit like Philip, but he's got the edgy, I don't know if he's Jewish or not, but he's got the edgy, voluble uh, of Philip vibe to him. And yeah, if Ron Silver were still alive, he did some of the audio books. Ron Silver? Yeah, yeah, I know Ron. I'm looking at Leave. Yeah. What, Ron Silver. Let me pull up Ron. Ron Silver. What, what's the, the book that he, the movie he made about the Klaus von Bülow murder? He played Henry Kissinger and Alan Dershowitz and Angelo Dundee. A Alan Dershowitz. Okay. And yeah. that was the most Ron. But he also did the audio book for Portnoy's Complaint. No. Oh. And he did the audio book for American Pastoral. And he's got, again, he, he, does a Philip persona very well, but he's dead. He died young. So offhand, I don't know who would play Philip. It would be interesting to see. It would have to be someone young enough that old Philip is a brilliant man. young man and they then get old. Yeah. Yeah. You might have to do three or four of those. So basically Denzel Washington is out. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> a true story. <laughs> Uh, one of my subjects, Charles Jackson, he wrote the famous alcoholism novel, The Lost Week. And my agent is a Hollywood guy, uh, Shane Salerno. He produced The Comey Rule for Showtime, and he also does agenting. He did, the, did a documentary on J.D. Salinger, etc. Anyway, he told me that Denzel was interested at one time in optioning my Charles Jackson book. Oh. And I'm wondering if he knew that it was... <laughs> Maybe he was thinking of another Charles Jackson. But I don't. I don't know. I don't know. He didn't end up optioning it. So, what are some teasers that uh, maybe you, uh, you want to touch on that people will be surprised about in the book that maybe they don't know about? Philip cut a pretty wide erotic swath. Browser I mean, history and stuff. Or? He was, uh, of course, married to the actress Claire Bloom, but he also had Tris. Mm -hmm. with Ava Gardner. He dated Jackie Kennedy in 65, oh. when she was probably the most famous woman in the world. No one knows what happened between him and Nicole Kidman, but they had a friendship. Mm -hmm. I had, I inherited, Philip had, because they were good for his back, he had three Eames chairs. Mm -hmm. They're very low slung and form fit in a very modern modern furniture. It's great, great, very comfortable. Anyway, he had a Eames chair, an Eames ottoman. And uh, I inherited that. It's downstairs in my front room. But the ottoman he called Nicole's seat. <laughs> because when Nicole Kidman would visit him at his Upper West Side apartment, he would sit in the chair and she would sit facing him on the ottoman. And so that's Nicole's seat. That's where my ankles rest now. So there's, there's uh, uh, Philip, again, this is why he gets a pretty hard rap. And, and somewhat deservedly so is because there was never just one woman in the picture, even when he was perhaps especially when he was married. What broke up his first marriage was a tryst with a Playboy playmate of July 1956, Alice Denham. So, you know, it's a racy read. What can I tell you? There you go. So it's going to be salacious, too, and everything. I love that. The If I have eight lovers show up to my hospital bed when I'm on my deathbed, they're going to be there to pull the plug out of the wall. That's what they're going to be there for. <laughs> <laughs> so that's they'll be, they'll be all scrambling. That's that's point. what Phillips detractors would say. They were there to hasten the <laughs> hasten the process. But no, I I was present, and I can assure them that's not the case. So there. So anything more as we go out? Anything we you may want to touch on or entice uh, people with to uh, order up the book? Again, I have been. To, it's Cynthia Ozick, who is. <laughs> one of the towering figures in American literature. She's going to be 93, I think, in a couple of weeks. She wrote the review of my book for the mm. New York Times Book Review, which is the most important review you're going to get. And it's going to be on the cover of not this Sunday, but next Sunday, April 11th, New York Times Book Review. And it calls it a narrative masterwork. Okay, there so... Wow. That's my plug. If you want to wow. read what Cynthia Ozick has called a narrative masterwork, and one with uh, plenty of spicy bits to it, there you then go. you could do worse than Philip Roth, the biography. There you go. This sounds like a wonderful read. And of course, uh, hopefully we'll expose more people to his work and get more people to read it. Is there leftover content that you see coming in a second book with this? You mean write more about Philip Roth? Yeah, like a book too. It's funny you should say that he wanted my biography of him to be two or three volumes. 
know? And even then, I don't think he would have thought it covered his sheer majestic importance. Wow. Um, but I, I would I, have demanded 10. There you go, 10 volumes. For my browser history. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's a long book, but it's one volume. And I like to think it's a pretty tight 800-page read. I have actually thought about writing a kind of memoir. And I have written that book, actually, about my collaboration with Philip, which was very interesting, though I say it myself. But I don't know if I'm going to publish that book, because it's been pretty challenging to write this one out. So <laughs> I can see how many <laughs> At the very are least, I'm going to wait a few done. years, yeah. let the smoke clear a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You'll be, yeah. You're going to be a porcupine maybe a little bit after this with all the arrows. <laughs> did, one question I'm curious about, did he ever ask to pr read any of what you were writing, or did you? was he in the dark the whole time? No, because I had really just, that wasn't part of our deal. If he had lived, mm -hmm. he would have been able to vet my manuscript for factual oh. accuracy, oh. not for interpretive content. Mm -hmm. He couldn't have said, I am not a misogynist, but he could say this never happened and I can prove it. But he didn't live to, to do that, which meant that the right to vet my manuscript reverted to his executors, which oh, was wow. a former girlfriend, a psychiatrist, Julia Gullier, and his agent, Andrew Wiley. And, and they were like, very conscientious that's him. You got it. and fair-minded about it. Yeah, <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So this is pretty cool. As we go out, Blake, give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs, order up the book, and all that good stuff. Again, my website is blakebaileyonline.com, and I have to buy tabs. They're very easily found there. I have an events page. I'm going to be doing a lot of virtual stuff with Peter Sagal of NPR, Don Winslow, a great crime writer, the cartel, and such like people. So I hope your listeners will join us. It's going to be fun. There you go. Do you have your next project lined up, or is this uh, you're going to run this oh my God. through the book tour and stuff? <laughs> I, I, I really you. just want to turn my toes up. <laughs> hey, next week's going to be fun. This, this writing thing, <laughs> I, I don't know. There you well, go. Hey, I, we hope you survive. So we wish you thank the best. you. Chris. No, I'm just kidding. Blake, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your new book, and thank you for spending some time with us today. And thanks for having me. There you go, guys. Go ahead and order up the book, Philip Roth, the biography. You can get it. It'll be available. You can pre-order it now, of course. It'll be available on April 6, 2021. And uh, yeah, named most anticipated books of 2021 by Oprah Magazine, Chicago Trib. The Guardian, Literary Hub, The Times, Financial Times, and more. So you definitely want to do that and learn more about the works and all that good stuff. Check it out and uh, be the first in your blog. Go to goodreads.com, for says Chris Voss. See what we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to youtube.com, for says Chris Voss. We teased you with uh, the good-looking Blake Bailey today to get people to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. So we used him as bait for that. And uh, also go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for, Blake, for being here. Wear your mask. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.